All right, so today uh, we start talking about large airways. So we'll talk about uh, bronchiectasis first. So the definition of bronchiectasis, irreversible dilatation of the bronchial tree, usually not too hard to recognize uh, on CT scan. And in most cases, infection is the most common pathway that results in bronchiectasis. So there's this vicious cycle of bronchiectasis where because of infection, there's impaired mucociliary function that leads to airway damage, which then predisposes the airway to recurrent infection, which damages the airway even more. So you get into this vicious cycle where bronchiectasis uh, predisposes to more infections, which then progressively make the, or make the bronchiectasis progressively worse. Now, in terms of the description of bronchiectasis, uh, there are three types, the reclassification uh, that you should be familiar with. So what are these three types of bronchiectasis? Are they fairly severe? No, that's not one of the read, that's not one of the described. Cystic read. on the right. Yeah, so the most severe is cystic bronchiectasis, um, which you see here. And then cylindrical is the mildest, and then... Varicose? Yeah, so varicose. So the... Uh, so this is purely descriptive. It has not. It, it doesn't really relate to the cause of the bronchiectasis, but it's descriptive in terms of what the bronchiectasis looks like. So cylindrical bronchiectasis is the mildest form of bronchiectasis. Usually, the airway should be the same size as the accompanying vessel. When it's slightly larger, then we call that cylindrical bronchiectasis. And the number of bronchial subdivisions. Distally are still usually normal, so the distal airways are not really severely damaged. When we get to varicose bronchiectasis, now you start to see this beating within the airways, and there is a reduction in the number of distal subdivisions of the airways here. So there's bronchiolitis obliterans or scarring within the distal smaller airways, and then the most severe form, cystic bronchiectasis. Here the bronchi are really ballooned out. And also, you can get infection within the airway itself, which can lead to these air fluid levels. So these air fluid levels can represent infection actually inside that those cystic regions of bronchiectasis, and the subdivisions are reduced even further with cystic bronchiectasis. So that's the reclassification of bronchiectasis in terms of just the appearance. Now, you did mention one other type of bronchiectasis, which is Traction. Traction, and that's caused by fibrosis, fibrosis and scarring, right. So here you can see bronchiectasis is chronic right up below battlectasis here. So when you have scarring, that can also give you bronchiectasis, but we call that traction bronchiectasis. So that's not bronchiectasis from infection, that's bronchiectasis from scarring. So those are types of bronchiectasis to be familiar with. If we're looking, if we're looking for a bronchiectasis, so here we have traction bronchiectasis in the upper lobe, in this case of sarcoid, in this case of NSIP, you can see the bronchiectasis within the lower lobes. So if we're looking for airways and we want to see them better on CT, what kind of reconstructions can we do? And yeah, these are minute reconstructions, so they bring out the more loosened areas. So you're looking for the airways, these are nice reconstructions. So we'll talk about some of these various causes of bronchiectasis, uh, you know, as we go through the lecture. So in this particular case, what, what are the findings? We can see there's bronchiectasis, but what are the findings and what do we think the cause of the bronchiectasis is? So what are the findings here? Is that normal? Is this a normal CT scan, or is there something wrong? Like some yes, more so on the left side, you have some nodular opacities, and then you have bronchiectasis, right? So what's the cause? What's the cause of this patient's bronchiectasis? Well, do you think there's architectural distortion here? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So there's architectural, which implies that there's going to be underlying I mean, kind of scarring, scarring. Kind of right? Underlying scarring. So do you think this is sarcoid? Sarcoid can give you upper lobe fibrotic changes. Do you think it's sarcoid, or does somebody think it's something else? 
not. Well, what do you think of these nodules? Right. So, what would you call the nodular pattern here? So you said these are central lobular nodules, right? Way, in fact, right. All right. So we is, have yeah. we have some disease that's giving us central lobular nodules and scarring within the upper lobes here with bronchiectasis, somewhat asymmetric, right? The left side is involved more severely than the right side. So what disease is it? Tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. In which case, these would be what kind of nodules? No, not random, no. You said they're central lobular. They would be what? Tree and bud nodules, right. So these are tree and bud nodules representing bronchiolitis in this patient with tuberculosis. So the bronchiectasis is also a cystic area here. So the bronchiectasis in this case is from tuberculosis in this patient. It's a 21-year-old woman with tuberculosis, right. So we know tuberculosis gives us upper lobe disease. These cystic areas that we see, often we, we read these as cavities on chest radiographs, but many times these are regions of bronchiectasis, especially if they're cylindrical. So you can see here on the CT in this case, what look like cavities here are really areas of bronchiectasis, okay, in patients with tuberculosis. So we can get tree and bud opacities with TB, you can have bronchiectasis, cavitary lesions as you see. Sometimes these lesions communicate with the airway, as in this particular example. Okay. Now what about this case? Where do we see the abnormalities here? Yeah, so this is right middle lobe and lingula, so this abnormality represents what do you think? Yeah, so this is bronchiectasis, but here the disease is limited to the right middle lobe and lingula. So here we would think about Lady Windermere syndrome, and, and the underlying cause of this would be a typical mycobacterial infection, right. Now chronic aspiration, this can also give us bronchiectasis. So if we see this in the lower lung distribution with central ovular nodules and bronchiectasis, we can think about chronic aspiration. Right middle lobe syndrome, this is when patients develop recurrent pneumonias within and atelectasis within the right middle lobe, and that can be from obstruction of the right middle lobe bronchus due to lymph nodes. So they obstruct the right middle lobe bronchus, patients develop bronchiectasis, recurrent infections, and can develop atelectasis in the right middle lobe. So atelectasis with bronchiectasis here in the right middle lobe from recurrent infections can occur with right middle lobe syndrome. Carcinoid is a tumor that can grow in the, uh, endobronchially, and that can result in dilatation of the airway also in bronchiectasis. So slow-growing endobronchial tumors can also cause dilatation of the airways. The abnormality on this chest radiograph is what? These I mean, there's these linear opacities, like overlying the right upper lobe. Look, looks like um, finger and glove signs. Yeah, so yeah. you have a branching opacity here, right? So that's a finger and glove sign. So finger and glove means that you have what? ABPA. Yeah, you have or mucoid or impaction. Yeah. So what can give you focal? What can give you focal regions of mucoid impaction like this? ABPA. So allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, right? So you would ask if the patient had a history of. Asthma, right? What else can give you focal region of mucoid impaction? Uh, yeah, so slow-growing endobronchial tumor like carcinoid, right? What else can give you focal area of mucoid impaction? Is there anything congenital? Um, congenital bronchial atresia can also give you a focal region of mucoid impaction. Here's a CT scan on a different patient with the same disease. So what's going on here? This is ABPA. So how do you know it's ABPA? The, the mucus is more dense. Yeah, so we have high attenuation mucoid impaction. So these branching opacities here represent regions of mucoid impaction. You can see these areas of bronchiectasis, right? So high attenuation mucoid impaction is associated with allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. 
So we've covered this before. I'm not going to go through it in, in any great detail, but this is associated with asthma and aspergillus infection. Results in those mucus plugs, damage to the airways. So they develop the uh, regions of mucoid impaction. Might give you finger and glove sign. Finger and glove sign means that you have an area of mucoid impaction. And these patients can go on to develop fibrosis in the upper lobes and then bronchiectasis also. So if we have a patient who's asthmatic who has bronchiectasis and regions of mucus plugging, then we can't consider allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Classically, it's taught that this is perihylar in terms of the bronchiectasis with ABPA, but it can be anywhere within the lung. And we talked about this other characteristic with allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, that you can have high attenuation mucoid impaction. So on non-contrast CT scan, these regions of mucoid impaction can be high in attenuation because of calcium and metallic ions within the mucus associated with the fungal infection. This is a young woman. What's abnormal on the chest radiograph? Interstitial yeah, so there's so we have increased interstitial markings here. The distribution of that would be it's, it's more central, uh, upper lobe Yeah, it looks like it's more upper lobe predominant. So what do you think this might be? Well, what gives you interstitial disease in an upper lobe distribution? Sarcoid, sure, sarcoid, sarcoid, sarcoid can do that. What else can do that? Well, we kind of, we, we just, we, we saw a case of it earlier, right, with infection. What is that? TB. Right, so tuberculosis, sarcoid, that can give you, a, there's a pneumoconiosis, although you wouldn't expect it in a 15-year-old. What, what pneumoconiosis is up below? Silicosis. Silicosis, right? So let's examine this a little further. Here's the CT scan. So tell me what's going on. Yeah, so there's bronchiectasis, the distribution is upper lobe, right? And you have some pretty extensive parabronchial opacities too, right? See all these parabronchial opacities here, right? So, do we see nodules? Yes. Yeah, there are, there are some small nodules here scattered throughout the lungs. So what do we think is going on in this person? Cystic fibrosis, right. So it's a young patient. So what we're looking at here, these interstitial markings are really areas of parabronchial thickening. You see that? This is parabronchial thickening here, okay? So we have a young person with parabronchial thickening, a low distribution here, and the CT really shows it nicely. These areas, these are areas of bronchiectasis with parabronchial inflammatory changes, central ovular nodules. So your first thought in the young person here would be, would be cystic fibrosis. Okay. Um, interstitial disease also uh, with parabronchial thickening, or it looks like parabronchial thickening in a young person, asthma is also in the differential diagnosis for that, right? Because asthma can also be parabronchial thickening. Many times, uh, Patients with cystic fibrosis may be misdiagnosed with asthma also. So cystic fibrosis, we know about this, uh, dysfunction of exocrine glands, viscous and tenacious mucus secretions, uh, increased lung volumes because of air trapping, increased hyalur shadows. It could be adenopathy from infection or in later stages, big pulmonary arteries or pulmonary hypertension. And the hallmark is bronchiectasis, especially tends to be worse in an upper lung distribution. They can develop agrolectasis, consolidations, pseudomonas, uh, pneumonias, of course, uh, pneumothorax, complication, massive hemoptysis. This is also a complication of cystic fibrosis. Whenever there's chronic inflammation of the lung, patients develop hypervascularity, especially from uh, small arteries. And so they're at increased risk for bleeding, and sometimes that can be life-threatening patients with cystic fibrosis. So if we have a young person with increased lung volumes, parabronchial thickening, dirty looking lungs, mid to upper lung distribution of disease, you're on the lateral, you can see the flattened diaphragms, increased lung volumes, we can really see the bronchiectasis very nicely here on the lateral view. So in a young person with bronchiectasis, our first thought is going to be cystic fibrosis. Okay? 
So here you can see the project assists very nicely. What is this thing? What is this nodule? That's a mucus plug, right? And when that's coughed out, you're left with these areas of bronchiectasis. Okay. All right, another patient, parabronchial thickening, central lobular nodules. What is going on here? Hypersensitive, well, hypersensitive pneumonitis gives you what kind of central lobular nodules? Ground glass. Ground glass, so these ground glass. Mm -hmm. No, do we like hypersensitive pneumonitis? No, okay, moving on. Well, I mean, we've covered some things. You must you must come up with some differential if you come across it. Like chronic aspiration? Sure, all right, so chronic aspiration can give you parabronchial thickening, can give you central lobular nodules, what else? TB, although the distribution for that should be upper lobe. Nothing else. What is the finding here? That, is there another finding here that you need to notice? The heart's displaced to the right. Why is that? Situs inversus. What? Situs inversus. Maybe the patient has situs inversus. Now what are you thinking? Cardiogenous yeah, syndrome. syndrome. So why does this patient then have bronchiectasis and inflammatory disease of the airways? Ciliary dyskinesia, right? Or a modal cilia syndrome. And here the patient has dextrocardia, right? Which is the clue. Okay. So the triad of cartagenous is nicely illustrated here. You shouldn't have any problem with that. Dextrocardia. Dextrocardia. Actually, yeah, so de well, that's not illustrated, is it? What's no. <laughs> the triad for cardiac? Unless you know something I don't. <laughs> so what, what's illustrated? So sinusitis. 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 The second image demonstrates sinusitis inversus, and here we have Bronchiectasis, that's the triad. Bronchiectasis, situs inversus, sinusitis, right? So that is the triad of Cartagena, right? So same as a modal cilia syndrome, genetic defect, impaired mucociliary clearance, and this is what causes then the recurrent infections. Uh, what percentage of people with a modal, with a modal cilia syndrome have situs inversus? Well, what percent of the modal cilia have cartagenous? It's the same, same question, really. Take a guess. 50%. Right? <laughs> <laughs> zero. Right. So those, those patients with a modal cilia who have normal situs, we call that a modal cilia syndrome. Those with situs inversus, we call it cartagenous. That's an interesting number, 50%. Why, why is it 50%? What? Is it oh, you're getting too fancy. <laughs> it is, it's thought that during embryology, proper ciliary function is required to get proper cell migration to have the normal situs. And when you don't have that situs, it becomes random. So 50% of these patients will have normal situs, 50% situs inversus. That subset with situs inversus, we call it cartagenous syndrome. Okay? So, if you, if you have immodal cilia but normal situs, we call it ciliary dyskinesia. So these patients also will have recurrent pneumonias, bronchiectasis, lower lung distribution of disease. Bronchiectasis, lower lung distribution, this was a case of ciliary dyskinesia. So this also belongs in your differential diagnosis if you have, say, a young person who has bronchiectasis and recurrent infections, well, why do they have it? Think about this, immodal cilia syndrome. Right? It's more obvious, of course, if they have situs inversus, but 50% will not. So cartagenous is that subset that has situs inversus. Hopefully, it's much easier when you're looking at the chest radiograph. Mm -hmm. okay. Of course, the most common cause of situs inversus on a chest radiograph is... Yeah, mislabeled chest. Yeah. 
the, I mean, there's the, there's a story about that. That the radiology department got a call once from a friend physician. What what's wrong with you guys? I, I send you this person for a chest X-ray five times, and every time you read the chest X-ray is normal. I said, what What do you mean? He goes, Well, the patient has situs inversus. So every time the X-ray was taken, they just assumed that it was mislabeled. <laughs> All right, so we've discussed this. Now, any immunodeficiency, so in addition to hemodocilia, any underlying immunodeficiency can also predispose the patient to recurrent infections and pneumonias. So this is an example of secretory IgA deficiency in this particular patient who developed bronchiectasis here in the right lower lung from recurrent pneumonia. So in addition to hemodocilia, underlying immunodeficiencies, that can be another cause of recurrent pneumonias and Yactasis. Okay. All right. Normal or abnormal? Abnormal. abnormal. Yeah. Good. What's abnormal? Tracheosis. Yeah. So what's wrong with the trachea? It's big. It's big. Yeah. Right. What do we call this? Munier Kuhn. Munier Kuhn syndrome or congenital tracheal bronchomegaly. Right. So these patients have big trachea, also this corrugated appearance of the trachea, that's also a characteristic appearance of Munier Kuhn's. Big trachea, big central airways also, and these patients are also prone to recurrent infections, okay? So big trachea, dilated central airways, that corrugated appearance as the mucosa kind of prolapses around the tracheal rings is also characteristic of Munier Kuhn syndrome. So called congenital tracheal bronchomegaly. Interestingly, 95% of patients are male. So it's associated with recurrent pneumonias, symptoms of cough, et cetera, infection. Also associated with other connective tissue disorders. Marfan's cutis laxa elegans can be seen with cystic fibrosis also. So dilated trachea, there, there are of course numbers for this. Tracheal coronal diameter greater than 26 in males, 23 millimeters in females, okay? Easy to recognize on CT, big trachea, big central airways, because of recurrent infections, they can develop bronchiectasis also elsewhere within the lungs. A nice volume rendered image of this case of Munier Kuhn syndrome. Normal or abnormal? Abnormal, okay. What's wrong? It's like in the bilateral lower lung fields, there's this cystic um, structures. Yes, and, right. And you have you have these the right. You have these cystic structures here in the lower lungs with air fluid levels. Correct. Okay. Here's a close up. These cystic structures with air fluid levels. What do you think this represents? Yeah. What? Well, before you get to that, what are we, we're, we're, what are we looking at? Is it honey? Does honeycomb give you air fluid no, levels? No. These are pretty large. So what you're going to call this what then? Dilated bron. So what kind of bronchiectasis is this? This is cystic bronchiectasis. You have a patient with cystic bronchiectasis with air fluid levels. Okay. So congenital disease of airways associated with cystic bronchiectasis. You said. What's the what's uh, the term? Well, Anybody? Uh, well, what about the first guy? I mean, you can't leave him well, out. Well, is it William? Williams Campbell well, syndrome. Well, yeah, yeah. Right. Williams Campbell syndrome. So Williams Campbell syndrome, congenital disorder, results in absence of cartilage within the more distal bronchi, which is why the dilatation occurs there, not in the trachea. Okay. So the trachea, main, and proximal lobar bronchi are not affected. These patients are also predisposed to recurrent infections and they develop cystic bronchiectasis, can develop recurrent infections, and that's why we see the air food levels in these areas of cystic bronchiectasis. Okay, so let's move on to tracheobronchial abnormalities. The abnormality on the chest radiograph is, how would you describe the abnormality on the chest radiograph? Or oh, you see a lucency on the chest radiograph? Oh, not just really. It's on the CT. What's abnormal on the chest radiograph? I think I do see a lucency on the 
maybe that's who I'm talking about, the right upper lung. All right, so, the de so describing the abnormality on the chest radiograph, we would say what? Very good. That's the abnormality on the chest radiograph. There's an abnormal right paratracheal opacity, which then necessitated the CAT scan in this patient. Now look at the CAT scan and tell me what's going on. Fistula with what? So, so you think there's a fistula between the trachea and the lungs? What do, what do we call those natural fistulas between the trachea and the lungs? <laughs> so your diagnosis here would be what? Tracheal bronchus, yeah. This is a tracheal bronchus, and it's branching. That's what you're seeing here. So what explains the paratracheal opacity then that necessitated the whole workup? What's the paratracheal opacity? Atelectasis or complication of tracheal bronchi or obstruction in pneumonia. So atelectasis or pneumonia within the segment supplied by the tracheal bronchus, okay? So that's what caused the paratracheal opacity, which is why we wound up getting the CT scan on this patient. That's a tracheal bronchus. Okay? So here's some more examples. Tracheal bronchus here. And this may, this can replace the uh, superior bronchus of the right upper lobe, right? Or it may be an accessory bronchus. So it might be, might be either. So here you can see the superior bronchus is missing in this case. So that's kind of replacing the superior bronchus. There. So bronchus coming off the trachea is called the tracheal bronchus, sometimes also called pig bronchus, although I don't think pigs have this anatomy. So uh, most commonly it arises from the right tracheal region supplying the apical segment of the right upper lobe, maybe a supernumerary bronchus or may, or may represent replace the uh, replacement of the right upper lobe segmental bronchus, usually asymptomatic, but can get recurrent infections or bronchiectasis also, if the patient gets intubated, that can also result in atelectasis there in the part of the lung that is supplied by the tracheal bronchus. What do we think here on this CT scan? Looks like there's an accessory bronchus coming off the bronchus intermedius. Yeah, so there's yeah. an accessory bronchus here coming off the bronchus intermedius, and where does it go? Towards the heart. It goes towards the heart. But it's blind ending, really. It really goes nowhere. What is this called? Cardiac bronchus. That's called a cardiac yeah. bronchus, right? So that's another kind of extra bronchus that you might see. A supernumerary bronchus is a cardiac bronchus, okay? So this comes off, and uh, usually these are missed, right? I mean, like, uh, but always go through the airways on a CT scan, make it a point to always check the airways on a CT scan, and you may pick up the, this kind of abnormality. Tracheal bronchus, you shouldn't miss. That, that's fairly obvious, but this is easily missed. Usually blind ending arises from the right main bronchus or bronchus intermedius. All right, so this guy is trachea. This guy is esophagus. What is this guy? Tracheal diverticulum. What? Is it tracheal diverticulum? Yeah, it's called a tracheal diverticulum or paratracheal air assist. Uh, in most cases, you don't actually demonstrate the communication with the trachea, okay? In this case, we, we happen to. These are very common. You will notice these if you look for these. Commonly found at the thoracic inlet, almost always right paratracheal region at the thoracic inlet. The point is, don't mistake this for pathology. It's not pneumomediastinum. It's not tracheosophageal fistula. It's not, you know, any, any kind of abnormal air leak. This is a paratracheal air assist or a tracheal diverticulum. Normal finding. This is the typical location. Okay, so there it is. And here we happen to see the hole in this particular case. Right. What's wrong here? Polypoid opacity within the trachea. Yeah, so there's an opacity in the trachea. What is your differential? 
You like that for aspirated secretions? Well, first, I mean, that's an important distinction, right? An important distinction is do we think it's aspirated secretions, in which case nothing, or do we think it's neoplasm, in which case big deal, right? So which do you favor? Yeah, so what, what goes against secretions? Not, no, not, not so much deeper as the shape of it, right? Yeah, yeah. They, they don't have kind of these kind of rough edges, so that's one. Second, the attenuation. What's the attenuation of secretions? Fluid, Fluid attenuation, yeah. right? Third, yeah. what else do we look for inside secretions to differentiate secretions from a mass? We look for bubbles, tiny bubbles. Oh, I guess but <laughs> those of you who go way back but so you look for tiny bubbles right small bubbles within that so here we're thinking neoplasm your differential of a neoplasm that might look like this one two three what what is your differentials number one squamous cell cancer number two Carc do carcinoids occur in the trachea no we will dismiss carcinoids number two Adenoid cystic tumor, right. That is the second most common primary tracheal neoplasm. Number three. Yeah, mucoepidermal. Now, those are all primary tracheal neoplasms, but is there another neoplasm you should also consider when you come across a case like this? Can we call this polyp? Can you call it, can you call it a polyp? I guess you can, right? You can call it a polyp. So maybe it's a polyp, right? What lives behind the trachea? The esophagus, right, esophageal cancer invading the trachea, you need to consider that also, okay, so those are the considerations in the case of a tracheal tumor. What about this case, what do we have here? We have what? Tracheal stenosis. Tracheal stenosis caused by what? Hmm? There's tracheal wall thickening, right? Notice we have tracheal wall thickening. Right? So is this regular or irregular thickening? Is this smooth circumferential thickening or is it somewhat irregular? Irregular. Irregular. So what could this be? Neoplasm. Well, do you, you like this for a tracheal stenosis from prior intubation? Do we like that? Yes or no? I mean, that's the most common cause of a focal region of tracheal narrowing, right? is post-intubation to stricture. Do we like that in this case, yes or no? No. No, no. why? Why don't we like it? What? It's irregular. It's really... They're usually smooth, but they can be irregular. Scarring can be irregular. Mm -hmm. It's a long segment, right? It's somewhat of a longer segment, right? Usually those are short segments. Mm -hmm. What about the location? where the tracheal strictures from intubation occur. What part of the trachea? Where? Is it down here at the level of the arch? No, it's at the thoracic inlet because that's where the ET tube is. Hopefully your tubes don't go down as far as the arch. Okay? So, if we're thinking then, now you can't think of inflammatory causes too, right? What are inflammatory causes that would give you thickening of the trachea? Wegener's. Sure. So Wegener's can give you thickening of the trachea. Okay, so that could be a consideration. Right? Amyloid, but is the amyloid irregular or usually smooth? Usually smooth. Wegener's also tends to be usually smooth. So those are some inflammatory causes of, of tracheal uh, thickening. Now, now you mentioned neoplasm. What neoplasm would you consider here? Adenoid cystic. Why adenoid cystic? That's what I remember from your slides. But that's what you remember from the slides. Yeah, okay. that's, that's, okay. Okay. yeah. <laughs> that's always reassuring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But what is it? What else do you remember from the slides about adenoid cystic tumor? About its growth pattern. Does it grow like in the lower segment? Yeah. What's it, how, how does it how does it grow? It grows submucosally, right? Yeah. So it extends submucosally, 
So that's why it can give you this irregular tracheal narrowing, as opposed to squamous cell, which grows right into the lumen. Right, okay. okay. So adenoid cystic can grow submucosally and can give you what looks like these areas of tracheal wall thickening and tracheal narrowing. All right. So we talked about tracheal neoplasm, squamous cell, adenoid cystic, mucoidermoid, although these, so these are primary tracheal neoplasms. These occur more commonly within the segmental airways than the trachea. These are uncommon neoplasms that might also occur within the trachea. So squamous cell is the most common. That is also associated with smoking can present as TE fistula from invasion of the esophagus. Adenoid cystic is the second most common primary tracheal neoplasm not related to smoking. This can grow submucosally and can give you this kind of irregular narrowing of the trachea. And then mucoepidermoids. So notice that adenoid cystic and mucoepidermoid, these are salivary gland types of tumors because they arise from salivary gland rests that occur in the trachea wall. That's why we have these types of tumors that can also occur with the trachea, okay? So mucoepidermoids, these tend to affect the segmental airways. They can cause dilatation of the airways like you see uh, in this example, that's mucoepidermoid. Here's an example that happened to occur in the trachea, okay? Now, there are other causes of uh, endobronchial tumors. Uh, in addition to squamous cell, right? If you're dealing with an endobronchial lesion, your second choice would be what? After squamous cell, your second choice for an endobronchial tumor is carcinoid. Right? So carcinoid would be your second choice. So they can also grow endobronchially. They can cause obstruction and atelectasis here, as you see on your left upper lobe. Metastatic tumors can also affect the airways, renal, thyroid, head and neck tumors, melanoma. Those are all examples of tumors that can breast. These are tumors that can also metastasize to the airways. The finding in this case, findings in this case. Yeah, so there are papillomas here that are affecting the trachea. And what do we see in the lungs? Cis. Cis, right. So what do we call this? Um, tracheal, well, I guess bronchial papillomatosis. Yeah, tracheal bronchial papillomatosis or respiratory papillomatosis, right? So these are papillomas that can grow throughout the airways. When they get into the lungs, they can form these cystic lesions. The complication of this is... What complication? Transformation of what malignancy? Oh, Squamous cell, cell cancer. Yeah. Right. That's tracheobronchial papillomatosis, right? So hemangiomas in younger patients, uh, also in your differential, right? So these are some examples of tracheal tumors. So squamous papillomas, these also can occur in the trachea. Tracheobronchial papillomatosis, as we just discussed, can also affect the trachea. So here we have a patient with right middle lobe atelectasis. What is the cause? Yeah, there's a fatty attenuation lesion where? Yeah, it's in the right middle of bronchus. So what is this lesion? What's more likely than a lipoma? Hamartoma, right. So just like uh, hamartomas can give you fat within the lung, for lung nodules, the same thing can occur within the airways. So that's a hamartoma here, endobronchial hamartoma causing right middle of atelectasis. Inflammatory lesions, granulomas, sarcoid TB, these can also give you narrowing. Amyloid can also give you narrowing of the airway, so that can also occur. Here we have a young man with strider. What is that normal? Yeah, so there's narrowing here in the trachea, the upper trachea here. So what do you suspect? from? Yeah, so you would ask about history of prior intubation. Right? So this is a stricture in the trachea. And with CT, we can see these, demonstrate these very nicely with the coronal and sagittal reformats. So these are focal areas of narrowing here near the thoracic inlet within the trachea from prolonged intubation. So what happens is the 
The balloon is inflated, results in pressure, necrosis, fibrosis, and stricture. These usually present a few weeks or a few months after extubation with the stricture and the narrowing of the trachea. Okay? This is why when you're reading the ICU films, you happen to notice that there's overinflation of the balloon cuff, you need to call them and tell them that, right? We don't want them to leave it like this because that's what can result in tracheal damage and the stricture of the trachea, right? So look for this on your ICU films, the overinflation of the balloon cuff in these patients who have endotracheal balloons, right? Another example, stricture from, you see how irregular it can look sometimes. And then here's volume rendering of that to show you this uh, tracheal structure of this person. Right. And then nice going through that to see how regular that is from the inside. Okay. All right, what do we call this? So this is saber sheath trachea, right? Where it's narrowed in width, but it's widened in the AP dimension. And what is this caused by? Yeah, so this is associated with emphysema and COPD. So this is saber sheath trachea, all right? So it's narrowed in width, but it's elongated when we look on the bio review in the AP dimension. That is saber sheath trachea. What do we have here? And if you write the slides, this is everybody's favorite. No. no, 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 no. That's your favorite? Like, well, tell me what's abnormal. What's abnormal? Calcification. Yeah. So you have these calcified nodules, and they spare the posterior wall, right? So this is TBO, tracheal bronchopathy osteoplastica. This is now your new favorite. Okay. So this is just osteocartilaginous transformation of the, of the cartilaginous wall there. So you get these nodules that extend into the tracheal wall. So usually it's an incidental finding, right? Usually this does not cause problems. You just, be, you just need to be able to recognize that as TBO. And it spares the posterior part of the trachea because there's no, there's no cartilage there, right? This is a patient who has tracheal narrowing and we can see it here, right? And we also see that it extends to the main stem bronchi, okay? So what could this be? Could be Wegener's. Could be Wegener's, right? Does this involve the posterior tracheal wall or not? Does it really look like it? Yeah, it looks like it's spare, right? So now Wegener's, if the person read the textbook, Wegener's is supposed to involve. So what, what inflammatory condition can give you diffuse airway narrowing and spare the posterior wall? This could be relapsing polychondritis. This is relapsing polychondritis, yeah. So this is relapsing polychondritis. So it's an inflammatory condition of cartilage that can affect the airways. And it can extend down to the main stem bronchi. And give you, sometimes you get calcifications too, as in this case, okay? So that's relapsing polychondritis. Classically, it will spare the posterior wall. Calcified pinna, calcification of the ear, which is supposed to be, or the, the, um, the cartilage of the ear, is supposed to be a characteristic finding of relapsing polychondritis. Okay? So it can cause diffuse airway narrowing, and it's supposed to spare the posterior wall. What about this case? Wagner's. So why Wagner's? Because you have sinusitis. Sinusitis <laughs> and tracheal yeah, involvement. And so we have this tracheal involvement here, and we have sinusitis. So this is Wegener's or granulomatosis with polyangiitis. So this can also affect the trachea uh, in addition to the kidneys and the lungs and everything else. So this can affect the trachea and bronchi. Uh, here's a case at presentation. Normal trachea three years later has some thickening here of the uh, trachea. Right? So these patients can have upper airway involvement, okay? So when we talk about diseases that spare the posterior wall, TBO, relapsing polychondritis, as well as to spare the posterior wall because of lack of cartilage, circumferential amyloid Wegener's, those are supposed to be circumferential in terms of the uh, tracheal wall thickening. Other things that can affect the airway, sarcoid, of course, can give you from the granulomas airway narrowing, tuberculosis, from the scarring can also give you narrowing of the airways. 
So, what is going on in this vision? Yeah, so the patient is breathing during the scan, and how do you know that? What's happening? Well, there's motion artifact. But, yeah, so look at the airways. Notice that the airways are changing in caliber throughout the scan. The airways are changing in caliber. So when are the airways collapsing? Expiration. So expiration is causing these airways to collapse, okay? So it certainly involves the trachea and also extends to the uh, main stem bronchi. What do we call it? Tracheal yeah, tracheal malacia or tracheal bronchial malacia that extends down to the bronchi. This patient also has emphysema, COPD. This condition is, is associated with COPD. So, but any anything that destroys the cartilage, like we saw a case of relapsing polychondritis, anything that destroys the cartilage in the airways causes the airways to become very compliant. So it loses, the airways lose their stiffness. And so in expiration, the airways collapse, and that can cause obstruction um, to the airways in expiration. So we call that tracheal malation. Normally, in expiration, you get a little bit of bowing of the posterior wall. That's normal, but it should not completely collapse. Remember, that's where you have the membranous portion there of the trachea. So this is the normal appearance in expiration. Okay? So here you can see inspiration and expiration on this patient. That's the normal movement of the posterior wall. If it's excessive, then you have a problem with tracheal malation. In this case, though, actually the whole trachea is collapsing in this particular case that we looked at here. Okay, So this is from increased compliance of the airway because of destruction of the cartilage. Uh, can be associated with COPD, but anything that destroys the airway. So it's thought that COPD results in chronic inflammation that causes the cartilage destruction. But anything that damages the cartilage can result in tracheal malacia. So here's a list of things that, that can do it. Okay. So the frown sign can be a sign of that, right? When you have this excessive collapse of the uh, trachea there. Okay. So sometimes you can get diffuse collapse of the airway, as you see here. Right? But when we're looking for this, we have to do dynamic expiratory CT because in inspiration, it can look normal. So you have to do CT when the patient is doing forced expiration. So you have to set this up properly to scan as the patient is doing forced expiration, and then that's when we look for collapse of the airway if we're looking for tracheal malacia. One problem is that uh, there is a degree of normal collapse in, in healthy people, right? 78% of healthy volunteers demonstrated greater than 50% collapse in, in the expiration. So you have to be careful about calling this on the CT scan. So first, it helps if the patient is symptomatic, and secondly, you're looking for more than 70% of collapse on expiration before you would actually start to call this on a CT scan. Okay. Now, to make this a little bit more complicated, there's tracheal bronchomalacia where we have actual cartilage weakening that causes the tracheal malacia. And then there's a condition called excessive dynamic airway collapse, where there's just hypermobility of the posterior membranous portion of the trachea. So normally, as we said, in expiration, it should not collapse that much. But if there's this excessive dynamic uh, collapse of the airway, then, then it goes in really far. And then with tracheal malacia, you really have a kind of an abnormal appearance uh, uh, of the airway here. I don't think in the boards they're going to go into this level of detail, okay? So if you see excessive collapse of the trachea, go with tracheal malacia. Uh, make sure that you know it's, uh, you know, you want to do it on expiratory CT. But in real life, we do see this. We see this quite often, especially in our CT scans for PE. And those patients probably don't have tracheal malacia. They probably have this excessive dynamic airway collapse, okay? And then there are these different shapes that you could see. Circumferential is definitely abnormal. That's tracheal malacia. There's also a saber sheath kind of variant to it. And then there's this crescentic variant. So, so you see how these look a little bit different than the excessive dynamic collapse. Okay. 
but on the boards go with trachea inflation. So here we have circumferential thickening of the trachea that also extends to the main stem bronchi with some areas of calcification. What do we think this is? Yeah, this is amyloid, right? So amyloid gives you circumferential thickening, can extend down to the main stem bronchi, can be associated with calcification. So uh, amyloid is protein uh, polypeptide change form this beta pleated sheet, and that beta pleated structure uh, is very insoluble and resistant to proteolysis, which is why it accumulates within tissues. So this can also accumulate within the trachea. So the way they look for it, the pathologist looks for it with Congo red stain and also this apple green birefringence is a pathomonic property of amyloid that the pathologist will look for. Tracheobronchial amyloid, this is the most common form of respiratory involvement. Uh, it can be diffuse or it can be focal, okay? So it can give you circumferential thickening of the airway walls like you see here might have a little bit of calcification there also. So that's tracheobronchial amyloidosis, okay? Might be focal, maybe just one part of the area is involved. So that's a variant of amyloidosis that you might also see. Another form of amyloidosis that can affect, that we can see in the lungs is nodular parenchymal, where they develop these multiple nodules. They can grow slowly. Sometimes they can calcify. So you can have these nodules that are scattered throughout the lungs, sometimes with calcification, and they'll be there for years. So this patient comes back year after year with these nodules that have some calcification that may grow slowly. So this is nodular parenchymal amyloidosis, right? multiple nodules that may be calcified. And then the bonus question for today, what about if you have cysts and calcified nodules? What about the con combined combination of calcified nodules and cysts? The visiting professor question for today. What disease can do this? So I'll tell you that I'll tell you that the nodules are from amyloid and the cysts are from LIP. Children's, yeah, Sjogren's can do this. So Sjogren's can have LIP and is associated with amyloidosis. So this combination of cysts and calcified nodules, you can't see with Sjogren's, okay? All right then, time to move on to the quiz.